G'day and welcome to the Paul Wallace channel. In these short stories of origins, I'm going to tell some short stories of anomalies in the news today, strange phenomena in the present day, and asking if there's any connection between those and what our ancestors had to tell us in world mythology and ancestral narratives around the world. Is there any connection between the things we experience today and what our ancestors were speaking about. And I'd like to hear from you, so I'm gonna end with a question so that you can jump into the comments and you and I can get into a conversation. And please remember to subscribe and click on the bell for all notifications. A few years ago, when I was living in Portsmouth, the local science museum was hosting an exhibition curated by some scholars from University College London. And it was a display demonstrating the passage of evolution surrounding various species. Well, I had a particular interest in this topic, having been involved in countless conversations regarding the intellectual battles between creationism and evolutionary theory. And I was very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to some genuine scientists who had done research in the area of paleobiology and who might be able to answer some of my questions. Now, at that point, evolutionary theory was using the language of teleological evolution. And they used this phrase to explain why in the fossil record, we have massive leaps from one kind of creature to the next. We don't really have a steady flow of intermediate changes. We seem to leap from this type of animal to this type of animal. So it demonstrates succession, but evolution, a little bit uncertain. So teleological evolution was a way of saying that evolution knows where it's going, that evolution knows it needs to land on a fairly stable arrangement of a creature. And that was the language that evolutionary scientists were using at that time. Well, I was intrigued by that. And I wondered if this was just other language for intelligent design. And so I went along to talk to the local scientists. I had a particular question about the whale. Now the modern whale is supremely adapted to life in the oceans. A particular kind of skin, a particular kind of eye, a cardiovascular system that works in a particular way, a nostril on the top of the head, a perfectly functional fish-shaped tail, so on and so forth. All these coherent functional parts make a whale a supreme aquatic mammal. But how did it get there? At that time, there were a couple of schools of thought. And one was that one group of whales might have developed from a seal-like creature that had developed from a dog-like or bear-like creature. Another type of whale might have evolved from ungulates like cows or goats. And that the largest whales are in fact giant swimming cows. But what I wanted to know was how could a bear or a cow suddenly produce an offspring with a functional fish-shaped tail, because intermediary stages have to have a survival advantage in order for the mechanism of survival of the fittest to work. So I wanted to know, how does that work? How do you suddenly get a functional fish-shaped tail? How do you suddenly get skin that can be immersed in the water permanently? And so I took my questions and I asked the questions and the scientist I was talking to said, oh no, he said, it's even more challenging than that. He said, because those changes, a lot of them have to happen all at once. Different kind of eye needs to happen at the same time. 
as a different kind of skin. Blowhole has to happen at the same time as a different functioning cardiovascular system. That functional tail that needs to come out all in one go. And I said, well, how does that happen? If all those things have to happen all at once, how does that happen? And he said, well, if you think about DNA, it's a collection of codes, right? So there's a group of codes that produces that tail, a group of codes that produces that eye, a group of codes that produces that skin, so on and so forth. All those codes belong together in a batch that will produce a functional aquatic creature. So it's just a matter of those codes belonging to each other. Well, I went away very thoughtful about that. Codes that belong together. Obviously, it raises the question of where the codes have come from and how they can be made and broken, encoded and decoded. And I wondered if this really was just other language for intelligent design. But are there other frameworks and how did our ancestors think about this? Well, for this, I go back to Plato. Two and a half thousand years ago, Plato was talking in very similar terms. And he had the language of what we translate as forms and particulars. Forms are the codes for a perfect dog, the codes for a perfect whale, the codes for a perfect bird. And then all the creatures that we see on planet Earth are in effect downloads of those codes. So you've got the coding, and then you've got downloads. And Plato said you can get a perfect download or an imperfect download. And you and I have a pretty good sense of whether the dog we're looking at is a good download or a bad download. Does it look like a functional, healthy, perfect dog or has it got some faults and blemishes? We can tell the difference. So he had this notion of forms, the codes, the batches of codes, and particulars, the downloads. But his framework wasn't exactly the same as, say, a Christian one would be, which would say, oh, well, God makes the codes, God makes the downloads. And it wasn't quite the same as a naturalistic evolutionary one. All happens naturally. The codes find each other. They find a coherence and they find their way into cells that will then grow according to those instructions. Plato had another view. Now, he believed in God in the sense of a cosmic source, which he believed was consciousness. But he did not credit God with downloading these forms into particulars. He said that was the work of the demiurgos, the craftsman. In Plato's worldview, there was another kind of entity, either an intelligence that went before us, or an intelligence from another dimension whose job it was to download the batches of codes to make the creatures that you and I are familiar with today. It's almost like he's talking about the master of the Matrix in the movie The Matrix, and it's a rather intriguing framework. Where did he get it from? Well, Plato argued he got some of his knowledge from observation and applying logic to that observation. He also said he got some of his knowledge from ancient Egyptian priestly information and other from altered states of consciousness. So what do you make of all that? It's a rich soup today. Are you a naturalistic evolutionary theory champion? Are you a creationist? Are you like Plato somewhere in the middle? Jump into the comments. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear what your observations and your logic might be and I'll be very happy to get into conversation and we can compare notes. While I'm with you, can I give a quick shout out to my book, The Scars of Eden? If you don't yet have your copy, you can get hold of it from Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. And if you'd like to compare notes with me, again, come to the Paul Wallace channel or The Fifth Kind TV on YouTube or fifthkind.tv and I'll be very happy to get into conversation with you. Remember to subscribe, Click on the bell for notifications and I'll look forward to seeing you in the comments.